All right, let's talk about prayers to the saints. As far as I understand it, the Roman and Eastern practice of praying to the saints in heaven is built on four biblical concepts. One, that the saints intercede for each other in prayer. Two, that all who die in Christ are alive with Christ in heaven. Three, that the saints in heaven mediate prayers to God. And four, that the saints are instrumental in salvation of others. So, uh, taking these four uh, concepts, it culminates in the practice of, of prayers to the saints. And I would affirm all four of them uh, as they apply uh, to embodied saints. But let's proceed forward and explore these and give uh, our best explanation of, of why Rome and the East pray to the saints. And by doing so, we are loving our neighbor. All right, so the first one, intercession of the saints. A popular Roman or Eastern apologetic is to ask Protestants if they ask fellow Christians on earth to pray for them. And when the Protestant says, yes, of course I do, the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox will say, well, we're just asking fellow Christians in heaven to pray for us. So they extend the intercession of the saints uh, on earth, uh, which all Christians would affirm, to include the saints in heaven. All faithful Christians ask others who are alive in the body to pray for them, and all faithful Christians believe it is effectual. So in this sense, virtually all Christians believe in the intercession of the saints. Charismatics in particular relish and practice this. My pastor, who was part of the charismatic revival in the 70s, um, was part of a movement that kind of recovered monastic piety, uh, even though that's not what they consciously realized what they were doing, as far as I know. They would have these all-night prayer vigils where the members of the church would take shifts in praying for various people and things um, in the world and for each other. So it, it was a form of kind of medieval monastic liturgy of the hours or the divine office. Um, and they did this and they continue to do this because, like our medieval fathers, like Christians throughout all the ages, they believed in the inter intercessory prayer of the saints. You still see this practiced in a lot of uh, charismatic and Pentecostal circles. I think IHOP has uh, uh, things like this as well. So all Protestants believe in the intercession of the saints and not a single Protestant uh, thinks that they are compromising the unique mediatorial role of Christ and his intercession uh, for us. Paul says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, and the man, uh, the man Jesus Christ, uh, 1 Timothy 2.5. So this is a, a popular proof text that Protestants will use to push back against uh, prayers to the saints in heaven um, because they view that that's, that's compromising uh, Jesus' unique mediatorial role. But they don't view it with it being problematic with the saints on earth. So I think that Protestants are selectively uh, applying this one mediator principle, and I don't think we should do that. I, I, I think that that's not the best pushback against uh, Rome in the East. Uh, this doesn't mean that we have to affirm uh, intercession of the saints in heaven by praying to them, but it does mean that appealing to Christ's unique uh, intercession and mediation is not the best counter-argument, because all Christians have to affirm that Christ truly is the one mediator, and Rome in the East affirm this, but that we as the body of Christ participate in that mediation, not in an ultimate sense, but in a participatory sense. And that's only made possible by Christ and in Christ. So I would affirm this as biblical, apostolic, traditional, whatever buzzword you want to use to uh, affirm it as good and true. We see uh, Paul encourages these lower forms of mediation, if you want to call them that, through prayers and intercessions. He says in Timothy as well, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life, godly and respectful in every way. This is good and pleasing to God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So Paul affirms and encourages the intercession of the saints. Uh, James says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man uh, with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, 
and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Uh, so there are numerous passages which affirm the orthodoxy of uh, intercessory prayer. Protestants believe these things harmonize with Christ as the one intercessor, the one mediator uh, between God and man. So since Protestants like Papists and Eastern Orthodox Christians acknowledge, we could call them sub-mediators besides Christ or under Christ or in Christ, the Protestant appeal to Christ as the one mediator against the practice of prayers to the saints in heaven fails to land uh, as a powerful objection, although there may be something to it. We'll get into more of that uh, later. So, bottom line with this, I take no issue with saints interceding on our behalf at, and, um, and in Christ, the one mediator, and I'm talking about embodied saints on, on earth. So there's no problems here in principle with this idea of intercession. Uh, we are still in the realm of lower C Catholic belief, the realm of uh, lower O Orthodox belief. So the second step is being alive in Christ. Now, the, the world after we die is, is a complicated thing, and we're not going to get into, into all of that now because there is, there's a whole lot of stuff with Hades and Sheol in the Old Testament, and I think things are reorganized and changed in the New Testament. Um, but when Paul indicates that when we die, our souls go to be with the Lord, he says, We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This is said in a passage that's mainly on the resurrection, but I think that it can rightly be uh, derived. I think what he's saying here is that our soul goes to be with the Lord in heaven after we die, this intermediate state between death and the resurrection of our bodies. We see that the souls of the martyrs uh, are in heaven in Revelation. So if we pair these two things together, we can say that all those who die in Christ are alive with Christ in heaven. And um, sometimes uh, Romanist and Eastern Orthodox Christians will uh, affirm this, and then they'll supplement it by quoting Jesus who said, For he, meaning God, is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Um, however, in those passages in the Gospels, Jesus is clearly talking about the resurrection. Um, so uh, I don't think that that can be used in, in their, their uh, apologetics. <clears throat> so while the thrust of these passages is really focused more on the resurrection, when paired with revelation, I think it is correct to believe that the souls of the faithful are with the Lord in heaven uh, while we are absent from our bodies. So the point is, we are alive with Christ in heaven after we die. All right, things get more tricky once we start affirming what the communion of the saints means, meaning the communion of the saints uh, uh, both on earth and in heaven. And, the, and uh, Roman and Eastern churches, uh, along with many Protestant traditions, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, and others, uh, they acknowledge the fullest expression of the communion of saints, meaning the saints on earth and in heaven are joined together in the mystical unity of Christ's body. And uh, Christians on earth, along with angels and Christians in heaven, are joined together in the worship of Christ, especially in corporate worship on the Lord's Day. I would also affirm this. The main text for this comes from Hebrews and Revelation. In Hebrews, Paul says, uh, we are surrounded by a great cloud of uh, witnesses, and presumably he's referencing all the faithful Old Covenant saints that he just finished listing, and most likely just all faithful believers who have finished the race. And in speaking to a worshiping Christian body, uh, he says, You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. So traditionally, uh, to my understanding, the letter to the Hebrews is thought to have been a, a sermon delivered uh, specifically to uh, uh, the Hebrews uh, of some uh, undisclosed area, um, but it's to a church assembly, to Christians, to Hebrews who have become Christians. And um, this passage is in reference specifically to the spiritual ascent um, into heaven during that corporate worship, during that assembly. Uh, we see this in the ancient call and response 
um, of the Sursum Corda. It's an acknowledgement of this reality. Lift up your hearts, the minister says. We lift them up to the Lord, the people respond. And this signifies their ascent in union with the heavenly host in worship. So there is this connection between heaven and earth when we come together to worship. That's traditional. That's what Hebrew seems to be indicating. We see some, a more of this connection in Paul's letter to uh, the Corinthians. He says, women should wear a covering on their head, uh, a symbol of man's authority over her for the sake of the angels. Why does he add this? This is, it seems strange to us, but it makes it intelligible if we think that heaven and earth are joined in worship of some, of some kind. Um, Paul is, in this passage, he is structuring the liturgy of the, the Corinthian worship and the symbols used therein. And this, this wearing, the, this head covering, the symbol of authority for the angels, perhaps is suggested um, uh, in response uh, to the intermingling of fallen angels and, uh, and the daughters of men in Genesis 6. But it may not be. It doesn't have to be. Either way, if the angels are taken to be heavenly angels and not human messengers of the gospel, it makes a connection between earthly and heavenly worship. So he appears to be ordering the women to cover their heads to signal a message to angels in heaven uh, of who their covering is, of who is in authority over them. Uh, this practice of women covering their heads, by the way, in worship is, is in all of church history for about 1900 years, and it was dispensed with in this last century, which has been a remarkable uh, century characterized by submission of women uh, to their husbands. Uh, so I guess um, that's me being sarcastic. Uh, but we should recover, we should recover this symbol. Symbols are important. The worship of heaven is uh, further revealed in Revelation. It's interesting that Revelation has been used in the past century for wild and false uh, speculations about the end of the world. But uh, traditionally, the book of Revelation, while primarily and definitely having this eschatological character and message, was also used as a liturgical text. John tells us in the opening sentences, I was in the spirit in the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. This has been interpreted to mean all kinds of things, but uh, I take it to mean he was worshiping on Sunday, uh, indicated by on the Lord's day. And uh, I would also push it further and say that he was in some kind of charismatic manifestation, not unlike uh, ones many Christians sneer at now, uh, indicated by being in the spirit. He then sees Jesus, who gives guidance, commendation, and threats of violence to uh, the seven churches in uh, Asia Minor. And then by chapter 4, John begins seeing into heaven and seeing what the worship in heaven looks like, which you might rightly describe as high church or liturgical. There's an altar and incense and robes and antiphonals. Uh, so upon entering the pearly gates, I think uh, many of the Puritans were probably pretty surprised. Uh, I love the Puritans, but I think that that's a little bit of an irony there. In the midst of all this, we see that uh, saints and angels have some kind of uh, mediating role in offering up the prayers of the saints, presumably the prayers of the saints on earth or the prayers of the saints in heaven or both, most likely both, um, at the altar before the throne of God. John says in Revelation 5, now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. It's a connection between incense, prayers of the saints, and um, at least in this passage, uh, they possess these things. The incense handled by these creatures and elders um, is uh, the prayers of the saints. Later, we see the incense offered up with, uh, with the prayers of the saints at the altar by an angel. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So there's something going on there with 
the say the prayers of the saints being offered up at, by the by the angels' hands through incense. We also see that the souls of the martyrs seem to be aware of what is happening on the earth to an extent, or at least God's interactions, in this case judgments, on the earth. Revelation 6, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So the Roman and Eastern churches, they, they string together these biblical observations, which are not many, but they string them together, and um, which are that the saints prayerfully intercede on behalf of others. Uh, the prayers of a righteous man affects much. The righteous who die are alive with Christ in heaven, and in heaven the saints mediate prayers. Therefore, Rome and the East say, we should ask saints in heaven to pray for us, just like Protestants ask saints on earth to pray for them. All right, so uh, mediators of salvation. This is uh, kind of the last one. There might, uh, so, so there might be something to all of this, uh, but then we see that not only do Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox ask the, prayer, ask the saints to pray for them, they ask the saints to save them. Uh, o Mary, Mother of God, save us, is a prayer in these churches. And the justification for such prayers comes from several passages which describe saints saving people. In Romans 11, we see Paul trying to save his Jewish, bro Jewish brothers. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. We see Paul speaking of his attempt to identify with whoever he is evangelizing so that he might save as many people as possible. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Paul speaks of believing husbands and wives, possibly saving their estranged spouse, uh, by remaining single and waiting for reconciliation. 1 Corinthians 7. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Paul exhorts Timothy to save himself and others through sound living and doctrine. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. 1 Timothy 4. And then James says the prayers of faith will save the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And then Jude makes a distinction between ministering with compassion on some and ministering with fear on others, and that by doing so, one can save them from fire. On some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. So we see that the saints are instrumental in salvation. Uh, and I, I, this is a, uh, a weakness born from a strength. Protestants zealous for, for the, the apex of our salvation, the, the ground and foundation of our salvation, Christ, and, and all glory going to him. I can, I can imagine a Protestant taking issue with these statements if they didn't realize they were in the Bible. If their friend said something like, I'm doing all I can so that by all means I might save some. And I can imagine a, a Calvinist saying, you don't save anybody. Christ alone saves. And, uh, you know, that rebuke would, would come from a sincere place. And in some sense, he would be right. But it's kind of being more holy than the Bible, where the Bible does talk about us being involved in saving people. And of course, all of that is, found, is, is through Christ. So we're not the final cause, that's Christ, but we are an instrumental cause. So these verses inform why these traditions ask saints in heaven not only to pray for them, but to save them uh, through their prayers. Not that the saints are saving them in and of themselves, but through their prayers to Christ, to the Father. In addition to this, there is a long history of the practice that we won't get into here. But if you survey the practice in history, you can, you can witness its development over time, where it's 
remembering the martyrs who died in faith, an acknowledgement of the fullness of the church on heaven and earth, and then it becoming more and more developed in, in prayers and more, uh, uh, it just becomes more and more embellished in various devotional practices. Okay, so I, I don't think we should be praying to the saints in heaven, but that's the best argument I can give for for it, and it's not totally unreasonable, but this is why I would still reject it. The strength of the Roman and Eastern tradition is that it highlights the entirety of the church on earth and heaven. I think that's a good thing. That's something that many evangelicals should recover. I would affirm it. We are united in the mystical body of Christ, and many of those saints are in heaven with him. I would affirm that God uses means or mediators in salvation and that this finds its ultimate source of mediation in Christ, who is the one mediator between God and man. We cannot do anything apart from Jesus. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Christ is pleased to use branches, to use human instruments and sacramental means to bring about that salvation. Preaching, teaching, prayer, baptism, the Lord's Supper, they're all means of grace, they're all means of salvation. Uh, I even also affirm that John saw saints and angels and fantastical creatures mediating prayers by their sensing of the altar in heaven. However, I do not think the biblical witness is strong enough to justify prayers to the saints in heaven. What happens to particular souls in the time between death and resurrection, what the soul is capable of knowing and doing, is largely unknown in scripture and to us. There's just not a lot there. I'm not a regulative principle guy. I'm a normative principle guy. So even though I don't think we need explicit command for all worship practices and devotional practices, we do need reasonable biblical precedent and principles to justify them. And nowhere in scripture do we see anyone praying to departed saints. All prayers are directed to God alone. And the passages used to justify the practice, to my mind, they're just not strong enough to outweigh the regular mode of prayer found in Scripture, especially because the passages used to justify prayers to the saints in heaven are not passages about prayers to the saints in heaven. It's just not about that. Even the scenes in Revelation of the altar being sensed by angels and saints does not indicate the prayers were to those saints and angels. They could be mediating, but those prayers were in all likelihood prayers to God. And maybe they have, and they have some kind of duty of bringing them to God or sensing the altar with them or something like this. But that you can't derive from that that the prayers were to the saints or to angels. Additionally, Revelation is just a difficult book in general. I wouldn't base such a prominent and huge practice on this apocalyptic, highly symbolic book in the first place. So the, the practice of praying to the saints, petitioning them, is very far removed from the original intent and context of the passages that they use for the practice. And so it gives me a great amount of pause, and I simply cannot endorse the enthusiastic and prominent role it plays in these Roman and Eastern traditions. I wouldn't say that they're sinful necessarily. I, I'm not going to call them idolaters. I do think it's an error. I think it's a distraction. And I'm open to being persuaded that it's more dangerous or less dangerous than this kind of uh, indifference or error, error uh, uh, view that I have of it. But when Rome and the East come to me and they say, this is really important, I just... It just doesn't have any weight with me. It's, it's, it's so far removed from what we see as the regular practice in Scripture that I can't get on board with it. When Jesus teaches us to pray, when we look at how our Savior teaches us, he directs our prayers to the Father. Now, Rome in the East, they would say, yes, of course, we should pray to the Father. And that's good that they do that. Uh, but that's the only 
he only directs us and teaches us to pray to the Father. And when Jesus prays, he's praying to the Father. Uh, when the saints pray, they're praying to the Father. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing else there. Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father who is in heaven. And then when he's teaching more about prayer, he says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So Jesus, the main thrust of that teaching is that he doesn't want us praying ostentatiously in public to receive the accolades of men. He, he wants us praying directly to the Lord in this kind of intimate communion with the Father so that the Father will reward you because he sees you in secret. So he's saying that the Father sees in secret, not that the saints see in secret or that the saints hear you, not that the, these departed saints hear you. So it, it could be that they do. But Jesus doesn't think that it's important enough to mention. He just mentions the Father and the Father alone. So we know for a fact that the Father hears. We know for a fact that the Father sees. We know for a fact that Jesus directs us to pray to the Father. All the prayers we see in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, uh, from the prophets of the Old Testament to the apostles in the New, is directed to God. There is no petitioning of the saints in heaven. There may be one in the apocryphal, uh, apocryphal accounts, but, but even traditions that have the apocrypha don't have that as a, uh, it doesn't have the same canonical authority. What we see over and over is petitioning and mediation of saints who are alive in the body. We do see that all over the place. And time would fail me if I were to show all these examples, but any regular Bible reader knows this is the regular mode of prayer and mediation throughout all of Scripture. This focus of, of saints ministering who are embodied is incarnational. It is, a, it is a profound affirmation of incarnational living in the incarnation uh, as... Uh, uh, and the incarnation finding itself in its fullest expression with Christ. In scripture, what we see is God working in history, which finds its source in heaven, but it works itself out with flesh and blood, with living and breathing saints who have dirt under their fingernails and sweat on their brow. Asking your pastor or your Christian brother to pray for you, who knows you, who rebukes you, who encourages you, who labors for the edification of your soul, whose faults and weaknesses can be seen by you, is very different than asking an idealized and most likely false conception of Mary or the departed saints who don't rebuke you, who don't talk back to you, who don't counsel you, who we don't know if they know what's going on in your life. Most likely they don't. These are very different things. From a pastoral perspective, the reality on the ground is that most people don't pray that much. They don't pray that frequently. They don't pray that fervently. And so when they do pray, we should be, we should be counseling them to pray in ways that we know are effective and that we know are true and real. We should be saying, pray to the Father. We should be saying what Jesus is saying. We should be modeling what Paul is saying. We know that Christ wants us to pray to the Father. We know that this is, in fact, who all the saints in Scripture directed their prayers to. So why would we substitute that for a possibility? Why would we add another practice that may not even be effective to people who don't even pray that often? <laughs> why would we want to crowd out what is certain with what is only thinly derived speculation? I think the balance is just overwhelmingly in favor of doing what we know rather than hoisting possible distractions of what is most likely vain prayers onto the people of God. It's, it clutters. I think it clutters. <laughs> Paul says that in Jesus and through faith in him, we may enter God's presence with boldness and confidence in Ephesians. He's exhorting us to approach God, ourselves with confidence, not asking others in heaven to do it for us. He says this all over the place in Hebrews. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time in need. 
Paul tells us of the realities of the new covenant for all believers. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them, right? Often in these traditions, there's an elevated, I would say sometimes unrealistic view of the saints in heaven or, or the saints in the past when Paul is saying the law is on your hearts. It's going to be in your minds. He goes on, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching." Hebrews 10. So again, what's he doing here? He's exhorting Christians to approach God themselves, God himself, through Christ and in holiness. And then he encourages the faithful to engage with each other. It's this uh, horizontal engagement with exhortations and stirring each other up in love and good works. God has placed us in communion with living, breathing saints in time and place. And Paul is concerned with those relationships, that mediation, that communion. This doesn't mean we deny the communion of the saints in heaven. They are there with us, united in Christ in some way. And it appears they have some kind of uh, liturgical responsibilities in worship. But when we see Paul and the apostles and the prophets speaking to us and how we should order our own lives. It is very horizontal. It is very, it is mediatorial on a horizontal plane. And of course, Rome in the East would affirm all this. They would say yes, yes and amen to all of that. But what, I, what I'm seeing is that the practical piety that Jesus and the saints in scripture are concerned with never really touches on anything that looks like prayers to the saints in heaven. Prayers to God, ministry and mediation to each other, and to the saints on earth. With respect to the prayers of a righteous man availing much, and the prayers of faith healing sick, the context there that James is talking about are the elders in the church, the living embodied saints. And then the context further is about Elijah praying for drought and rain while he was alive in the body not about his prayers after he was taken into heaven. So these particular principles may be applied to the saints in heaven, but that isn't what James is talking about, and it isn't what we see in Scripture. The main takeaway from that passage, I believe, is that we need to uh, become holy ourselves. We become the righteous man. We strive to become those righteous men so that our prayers are effective that our prayers are powerful, to bring in this endless petitioning of saints in heaven to save us and to pray for us, I, I think is, you're, is lazy. It's a lazy spirituality. I know that's going to be offensive to some. Uh, I'm not meaning to offend. I'm, I'm just shooting straight. I'm just, this is just what I think comes out of the text. This is, this is I think, an honest assessment of what is in Scripture, We don't want to cultivate lazy spirituality. We want to do the hard work ourselves. We don't want to be constantly deflecting to others. God is a warrior, and he basically is calling us to be warriors. So he wants us to engage with him. He wants us to wrestle with him. Prayer is violent. Prayer is wrestling like Jacob wrestled with God. God delights in that kind of thing. And when you delegate that to someone, you wrestle with God for me. I think that you're depriving yourself of growth and blessings that Jacob got when he wrestled with God and that you can get when you pray to God and wrestle with him yourself. This doesn't mean that we can't ask for saints, other saints to pray for us, but what we see this, what when we see it in scripture, when we see others uh, being prayed for, it's embodied saints praying for other embodied saints. And I think one of the reasons in part for that is because those saints will wrestle with you too. <laughs> those saints will rebuke you, they'll counsel you, they'll encourage you, they'll edify you. Um, with the saints in heaven, we don't know if they can hear us. We don't know 
uh, and they don't speak back to us and they don't counsel us directly like an embodied saint does. We can look at their lives and we can emulate that and we can honor them and we can be thankful for that and we can learn from that and be edified. But what we see in practice in scripture is saints pushing back, saints wrestling, saints rebuking, exhorting, all, all of that. So the, the, the blessed souls of the faithful in heaven, they, they just don't do that. But the blessed souls of the faithful on earth, they, they do. They will do that. And I think you can benefit from it. Lastly, the passages about the saints saving people are all about living saints, embodied saints, every single one of them. The thrust of those passage, passages, the main takeaway, is not to beg others to save us, but to become the kind of person that saves others. If your spouse leaves you, remain single and pray for reconciliation so that you might save your estranged spouse. That's what Paul is getting at. Jude is saying exercise discretion in your evangelization and discipling of others by having compassion on some and then using fear on others so that you, you can save them. Be accommodating with the weaknesses of others, Paul encourages us, so that by all means you might save some. That is the application. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So that means when Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might save some, we translate that as you should become all things to all men that you might save some. Not, well, Paul and all these others are so righteous, let me develop a speculative piety that relies on them to save me. It's, it's, it's such a, it's, it just lands in the wrong spot. That's, that, to me, is just not the import of what Paul or Jude uh, are getting at. Paul's command to Timothy is to guard sound doctrine so that he might save himself and others. It wasn't guard sound doctrine which begs for the saints in heaven to save you through their righteousness and their prayers. Ultimately, I think that this, is, this deviation, this error, is a less manly form of holiness. It's not as manly as engaging in the battle yourself, directly, taking these things from Scripture and applying them to you, and not relying on others. Of course, we do rely on others. I'm not denying that. But there is this import in scripture, which is to edify you and to strengthen you and to fortify you, and that you should take that and implement that into your own life. So each of these four concepts in scripture are true on their own, and uh, the difference is it's just in reference to embodied saints. The only exception would be that the mediation in heaven, which, which uh, John sees twice, um, but even there, we can't derive that the prayers were to those saints. They were, if we look at the whole flow of scripture, those, those prayers were to God and they were, they were mediating them in some kind of way with the incense, but we can't take from that, that that's, that the prayers go to them. The application of prayers to the saints, I just think is a distraction. It's a deviation from how the scripture intends for these truths to be applied. And so I think that the best and wisest way forward is to recognize the full communion of the saints in the mystical body of Christ in heaven and earth. And we do that in our, we do that in our liturgy at St. Athanasius. Uh, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Uh, we give thanks uh, with all the angels and the archangels and the host of heaven, and we sing the Sanctus together, and we believe that we are singing that together with the saints in heaven. We are acknowledging the fullness of the church, the church in heaven and, and on earth. But we don't practice prayers to the saints. We continue to pray to God alone. That's what we should focus our energies on. Our prayers to God alone, who desires to hear you, who desires your prayers, who desires to wrestle with you. And to focus our energies in our own holiness, our own sanctification, so that we will become effective intercessors uh, in Christ. And that we focus our energies in ministries to embodied people in time and place. The benefits of this are, enum are, are just numerous. We only scratch the surface here. But by doing these things, I think that we can say we are doing all we can to save as many people as possible.